Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. In the last episode, I introduced a rather unconventional engineer, one of the creators of jet propulsion technology, Jack Parsons. Parsons was the first rocket scientist, and probably one of the few scientists you'll ever hear about who went on the record about summoning the devil during an experiment. In part one, I described his childhood and education, how he met his best friend and collaborator, Frank Molina. I mentioned that Parsons was starting to live two lives, one in engineering and aerospace, and another in occult and magic. When he was 20 years old, Parsons met Helen Northrup at a local church dance. They dated for a short time and were married in April 1935 at the Little Church of the Flowers near Los Angeles. They moved into a house on South Terrace Drive in Pasadena while Parsons worked at the Halifax Powder Company. Parsons spent most of his money earned there on the Galsit Rocket Research Project, and his wife was not happy about it. Being the model husband, he decided on a part-time job to help the family. For extra money, he manufactured nitroglycerin in their home, constructing a laboratory on their front porch. At one point, he pawned Helen's engagement ring and often asked her family for loans. As one might imagine, this wasn't helping his marriage, but Parsons' propulsion research was gaining momentum. In April 1937, Caltech mathematician Quan Quisson joined Parsons' group. Several months later, Weld Arnold, a Caltech laboratory assistant who worked as the group's official photographer, also joined. The main reason for Arnold's appointment to the position was his provision of a donation to the group on behalf of a strange, anonymous benefactor. The group became well known on campus as the Suicide Squad for the dangerous nature of their experiments, and they attracted attention from the local press. Parsons gained further attention and media publicity when he appeared as an expert explosive witness in the trial of Captain Earl Kinnett. He was the head of the police intelligence in Los Angeles. He was also accused of conspiring to set a car bomb in the attempted murder of private investigator Harry Raymond. He was a former LAPD detective who was fired after whistleblowing against police corruption. When Kinnett was convicted in large part to Parsons' testimony, which included his forensic reconstruction of the car bomb and its explosion, his identity as an expert scientist in the public eye was established despite his lack of a university education. By 1938, the group had made their static rocket motor, which originally burned for three seconds. Now it ran for over a minute. Another scientist became involved in the Galsit research project, Sidney Weinbaum, a Jewish refugee from Europe who was also a vocal communist. Weinbaum led Parsons and the group in the creation of a largely secretive communist discussion group at Caltech, which became known as Professional Unit 122. The egalitarian ideals appealed to Jack Parsons, but there was a lot he didn't like about the politics. Despite pressure from Weinbaum and the rest of the group, he refused to join the American Communist Party. This caused a rift in his relationships with the other members of the group, and things began to fall apart. It destroyed his friendship with Weinbaum. This, coupled with some money troubles and the need to focus on paid employment, led to the near disintegration of the Rocket Research Group, leaving just its three founding members by late 1938. Jack was feeling pretty down, and this is where things began to get really weird. In January 1939, John and Francis Baxter, a brother and sister who had befriended Jack and Helen Parsons, took Jack to the Church of Thelema on Winona Boulevard in Hollywood, California, where he witnessed the performance of a Gnostic Mass. Celebrants of this occult church had included Hollywood actor John Carradine and gay rights activist Harry Hay. Parsons was intrigued, having already heard of Thelema's founder and outer head of the Ordo Templi Orientis. Alistair Crowley. Parsons was introduced to the leading members, Regina Kale, Jane Wolfe, and Wilfred Talbot Smith at the Mass. Feeling both repulsion 
an attraction for Smith, Parsons continued to attend the church's events for over a year. He continued to read Aleister Crowley's works, which increasingly interested him and encouraged Helen to read them as well. Parsons came to believe that the reality of the Philemic magic was a force that could be explained through quantum physics. Jack and Helen were initiated into the Church of Thelema in February 1941. Parsons adopted the Thelemic motto of Thelema Obtentum Prodero Amoris Nupce, a Latin mistranslation of the establishment of Thelema through the rituals of love. The initials of this motto spelled out Topan, also serving as the declaration to Pan. Commenting on Parsons' errors of translation and jest, Aleister Crowley said, the motto which you mention is couched in a language beyond my powers of understanding. Parsons also adopted the Thelemic title Topan, with Topan representing in Kabbalistic numerology 210, the name which he frequently signed letters to his occult associates. One of the leaders of the church, Wilfred Talbot Smith, wrote to Aleister Crowley saying that Parsons was a really excellent man. He has an excellent mind and a much better intellect than even myself. Jack Parsons is going to be very valuable. Wolf wrote to German OTO representative Carl Germer that Parsons was an A1 man, Crowley-esque in attainment as a matter of fact. Smith even nominated Parsons as a potential successor to Aleister Crowley as the outer head of the order. Crowley concurred with such assessments, informing Smith that Parsons is the most valued member of the whole order, with no exception. Wow, that's serious praise from Aleister Crowley. In the magical, mystical church of Thelema, Jack Parsons was going places. Things weren't taking off, so to speak, in the rocket research, but it wouldn't be long for that to change. Taking a step further down the occult road seems to bring some good fortune to his other life as a rocket scientist. In the next part of my series on Jack Parsons, I'm going to take the Vanadium audience to some deep, twisted places. But I think it's important. The story of Jack Parsons is one about the hidden underbelly of the history of science and technology. The first rocket scientist was also a practicing wizard. Tune in for part three. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.